recognized assets and liabilities. Now, knowingly that many people have not done this or not, but in Indian camp you would have looked at it in this way, I'm sure, because the examples that we have set, we've set them in the form that they are what they look like in Indian Gap and what they now look like in India. So, so it's nothing else but either you take a proportionate value and put it up on your balance sheet or you put it up as a fair value. Now, this is unique to NDS and IFRS because US GAAP is different. They don't allow these options to exist. They only talk about fair value. So whenever you see options, just for your additional knowledge, that's only NDS or IFRS. US GAAP, very little options. Everything is fair value. And the other financial instruments you know, that meet the definition of AS32, whatever you can do, that's not, nothing great about it. So that's just the how you calculate the minority interest and put it up. Now, I put this slide in, 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 uh, in the center again just to draw the attention. We spoke about it, but this you have to keep on refreshing yourself that this is how goodwill is measured. It is the acquisition date, fair value of the consider the aggregate of all of these. And remember these words, only key words have been brought in here. Therefore, this is the essence of the standard. You cannot remove the word acquisition here. The acquisition date fair value is very important. And that's why determination of the acquisition date is so important. Now tell me when there is a when there are agreements uh, between you know a share purchase agreement and SPA, SHA, if you know these terminologies, what how do you come to the closing date? Or how do you come to the date that this is the date when the acquisition happens? When? You said that in the morning. Somebody else. When? Just to repeat, this is what we, we spoke, but just again, when the control right, comes in, when the assets are, are in, when everything seems to be that, okay, whatever we decided is now done. That's the acquisition date. So, there may be some open items, therefore what normally, practically what is done is, the, um, the uh, agreement will say, this is the closing date, then you still have a month, you know, within which you need to close off everything and that will be the actual closing date for adjustments, like working capital adjustments. Why? Any idea? I'm taking practical thought processes, I'm not bothered about uh, all the myths and pieces because you need to talk the language when you're sitting with these people, right? So working capital adjustments, why? Because those stay on a daily basis. It's absolutely. Simple, because that's the most important thing. As of that date, working capital was different, and I acquired it. I mean, talking of large organizations or small, it matters, right? Even that 50,000 will matter at some point in time. Because if I have paid you for it, and if it is not happening that way, then I need an adjustment, period. So, the acquisition date, fair value of the consideration, the amount of any non-controlling interest that is there within the organization, and in a business combination which is achieved in stages, which I said now put the more, I mean put more of the uh, complexity, the acquisition date fair value of the acquirer's previously held equity interest in the acquiree. It sounds very monotonous to read all this because it's acquirer, acquiree. Wait till you come to reverse acquisition and see what happens. Anyway, here I'm telling you of a simple scenario, and this is this is an everyday matter. What stops me from acquiring uh, another chartered accountancy firm as a merger in my case on a creeping acquisition. I may not have the faith and the confidence that this merger will work very well, so I do a creeping acquisition, 10%, 30%, 40%, and then balance whatever, but every time that I do this, when it comes to the actual acquisition, you need to make adjustments for the past. That's what this is. What happens? Now you get in control, means you're going to consolidate. And the moment you're going to consolidate, and you're going to get control, you need to fair value your prior adjustments or whatever you held and book the profit or the loss through the profit and loss account. Remember the first, second slide, impact of India is 103, volatility. This is where I, I keep on linking these aspects, because these are now through the profit and loss account, not anywhere else. All right, so that's important. So these also adjustments have to be made. And then you come to the goodwill. I mean, it's, 
it's after that. So the net of the acquisition date, fair value of the assets and liabilities. So the, the, the culmination of the first three, four items minus the net assets will give you the goodwill or the negative goodwill as it may be. I brought this inside again only for the sake of reiteration. <coughs> now these are examples. Does anybody agree to this slide? Anybody agrees with this slide? Okay. How many do not agree with this slide and how many agree with this slide? If I have no answer, I don't know what to do. <laughs> There's nothing wrong in this slide at all. It's just a pre-known question, that's all. Because the post-known questions can be others, okay? So this is pre-known question, it's fine, it's absolutely fine. This is the way Indian gap is. But I need you to talk, right? So, all right. So computation of goodwill in case of a wholly owned subsidiary, 100% simple example. You will never get something like this, okay? This is not an exam, this is not a multiple choice question. Or you can assume this to be an MCQ, which you're also going to do at the end of the session on December 17th. But um, this is just to get you into the field that this is what you have seen at the Indian Gap and a slight difference on the next slide with India's 103. Look at it. The purchase consideration is the same. The fair value of liabilities has been done, assuming the fair value of tangible assets is subtracted. Therefore, you have the fair value of now the identifiable intangible assets, which are nothing but, in this case, three non-compete agreements, trade name, customer relationships. This is very simple. The figures that you put there, those have to be derived. That's the fair value. Okay? How do you come to fair value of all these items is what the whole evaluation aspect is. How many firms who are... Uh, practicing to valuation. Not, don't tell me that capital controller CCI valuation, huh? that for me is, <laughs> forget about it. And don't tell me DCF, huh? because I know what DCF people do. <laughs> they do one spreadsheet and they multiply and they add and subtract without any thought process. No, not that. Tell me exactly who's practicing valuation. If you've not done it, it's fine, but then don't you think that is what you want to do with all this beautiful analysis? Otherwise, You'll have to go to somebody and say, please do this, and then you will just put the number. Use of experts, second slide. Impact of India is one three. Now you realize, four impacts I have put. I'll leverage them wherever I go. Use of experts. What stops you from becoming a valuation expert? This is important, because everything is fair value. If you don't do it, you will only be the person to take the number as given to you and put it on the paper and say, okay, fine, I'll do it, it, finished. And I am relying on the work for use of an expert. That is very simple to do. But you will never go to the essence of it, which you still might need to do in the case of an actuary, because that's a very different science. Well, you do that, right? For employee benefit calculations. Uh, yeah, and even for a normal, uh, I think, uh, yeah, AS15R. Right? So, our auditing standards, of course, is not uh, What uh, uh, mistakes which we make is that uh, we just directly rely on the use of experts. I think what he's saying is that as an accountant, you should not rely directly on the use of experts unless you see his uh, capability. And you have some essence knowledge where you will be able to taste that. You will be able to question him and then come to a conclusion. Don't just directly rely on what he is. I, I, I very much uh, resound that. But to question an expert, you need to you know need something. To right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the whole beauty. That's why I said that. Volatility, use of experts, purchase price allocation are the impact of India's 103. Uh, Okay. Now, customer relationships, trade names, non-compete agreements, very
Where are they written down anywhere else? They're all there. This is to be deciphered and then you work on that and then you come. So the goodwill has changed. 600,000 to 400,000 because of the 200,000 impact. So any, uh, one, actually, uh, one more aspect is that anything which is striking you when uh, this example is given, I think one another important thing which is there in the standard, that what is the total consideration? Total consideration is 1 million, mm -hmm. right? And uh, what is the goodwill? Is 1.4 million. So 40% of the total consideration is the goodwill. So standard says when such a large goodwill arises, you again retest it whether you have done it proper calculation or not. Whether you have identified the intangible assets, tangible assets properly or not. Uh, there will be always a doubt you have done some mistake. So what standard this time is that again you redo your all the calculations and see whether that 4 lakhs is correct or not. This point becomes more resounding when you do, uh, when you come for the second aspect of food. Uh, when you're doing business combinations by control because what happens is at that point you are led to believe that everything is okay and the goodwill is a big because what was the idea of getting goodwill to a workable amount was to see whether all the intangibles have been taken care of because in this world of dynamism do you believe that somebody pays a price just like that and and the answer is very simple it all rests with the willing seller and buyer because they know what they, the buyer knows what he's paying for so he will precisely tell you that this is what we have paid for because the negotiation table you will not have the, the uh, you will not be given on a plate you will, if your part and parcel is excess you need to decide for this because this is what what did you pay for you don't say i pay goodwill what is goodwill so it's these are the, the bigger points and here the point that he is bringing out is very important because if you have a still a bigger amount means you lost out something unless you say no this is fine that, that needs to be done this is also important from an audit angle one part of the story is company corporate and bring it one part from an audit perspective both the ways to test it to retest it and have you retested it for finding out whether everything is fine. Yes, so yes, disclosure also, I think, justification and only Absolutely. Only if I talk of disclosures, we will make something. That earlier slide mm -hmm. of yours, those two or five or six non-identifiable assets, maybe we should use that as a basis mm -hmm. mm -hmm. to see whether it is on account of that. Exactly. But what for yes, the management to also disclose it. In the like where I said, when you see 40% or 60% lying in the goodwill, at what stage as auditors, can we come into this? I'll tell, tell you what, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, um, let me tell you, um, when purchase price allocations are done, and especially now with India's one three coming in, it is a necessity. It used to be earlier when we done with IFRS was involved, uh, so motto people were taking care of it. The thought process has, has really moved in quite a bit to understand the nature of the business. My first question to you, and as a response to you is a question, do you understand the business of your company that you audit? If you, if you believe you do, then you really need to step in and get the answers for yourself. Because that's, as an auditor, you can only do probing the questions. Purchase price allocation cannot be done by the same firm that does the audit. Because it's independence impaired, all right? So valuation aspects of this will be done by an independent agency and then you do your or as an auditor. And as an auditor, I always ask the question, do I understand the nature of business of the client that I audit? That's where your answers will be. There's nothing written down where I can tell you that, okay, go and find this here. No. Every business is unique. This, is, this seems to be simple because I have picked it up as an example from an IT company because you find these things in an IT company like this. But there could be pharma companies, power plant companies, oil and gas companies. The nature is quite different and you need to understand the nature of the business. That's what we buy answer to you. Financial service companies could be the high trading. Very true. Yes? Right. Customer relationship, trade name, and non-competitive demand. Now, if I take first one, customer relationship, so it means I should analyze on the basis of number of debtors increase over the period of years, or how I will come to the conclusion that it is customer relationship. 
I will. I would like to take this up as a question when we do with fair valuations because this is entirely diver, diverging my view on that. I can answer you separately. It's uh, even immediately after this because it will take the entire thing to fair valuation. I have to explain to you what you need to do to arrive at customer relationships. Let's not get into that right now because we will be diverting. Immediately after this, I'll, I'll talk to you, and then probably you can spread the word whatever. Okay. Uh, example. There's another one. Just simple one, but to drive home the point that. Uh, Computation of goodwill in a case of a subsidiary which is not holding on. So there's 80% uh, parent and 20% non controlling. So Indian gap, please read that. Huh? It's Indian gap. So the old one says blah blah blah, 1 million, 200, 600, 400, subtotal 600, 600 is the goodwill. But because you don't own 20%, you subtract the proportionate amount and that's about it. So it's simple mathematics. What happens under NBS? What is the difference? From the 480, you come down to 350. But please remember, what have I done here? I have gone and reduced fair value of non-controlling interest. Because there were two options, if you remember, to do the adjustments. One is fair value, and the other is proportional value. Right? So here I picked up fair value. So this is a number which comes again from a valuation methodology that you put it and you minus and you get the goodwill. But if you do the proportionate one, then it will look like this. Uh, this is sorry under Indian gap, but under India's, if you look at it as proportionate, it will look like 80,000 out of the 400 because you have 400 in India's, remember, mm -hmm. as a goodwill, and therefore the proportionate share. So you are allowed to do either. That's a choice that is left for you, it can be decided, and there's no reason why one is to be picked up with the other. I would go with the fair value because everything is being fair value, there is no need of doing this uh, again and keeping it as a separate scenario. Okay. So if you look at it, goodwill amounts are different. Although overall net worth will not be different because on the other side you will be creating a change in the minority interest. Uh, you need to ponder the whether you need a higher goodwill or not from the standpoint of uh, you know looking at the impact. Well, bargain purchase is nothing but negative goodwill, very rare, but you can encounter. That's where I wanted to drive home to Ajmai's point. This point is where you need to again revisit the point of goodwill because this is a very, here the standard states it very clearly that when you come to the goodwill figure, please revisit it to see whether there has been a proper allocation towards identifiable assets and the identifiable intangible assets also so that your goodwill figure is more or less what it should be or not be at all and there will be a bargain purchase remaining. So you need to test this at that point in time. There is nothing but that. So one important thing here, sure. that is a gap, uh, uh, difference between IFRS and Indies. Uh, yeah. That the third one, I think if you would like to just... If no evidence exists, yeah. So, so basically what happens when there is a bargain purchase and then you work out that what is the differential, the <coughs> differential gain under IFRS, you will be taking it to PNL immediately. Okay. However, there is a kawa under INDAS. It has been it has to be taken to capital reserve and not in the PNL. And why is it coming like that? Anybody can answer this. It is again coming from your Indian gap because in Indian gap, that's what we were doing. So we are happy doing what we are doing. So we are happy doing this now also. But it's actually a car out, and I, I don't know whether whether you are happy with this because. It I think, uh, I think the one is, is uh, so I had a discussion with the institute and uh, the power is mad because they are not sure that it will be missed. Yeah, yeah, I know that's the reason why. So basically what happens is it goes and sits into your capital reserve. That's where it goes and sits into it. Normally because if, it's, if you uh, uh, allow to take it into b and then they are saying that it will not be fairly valued other assets and they are not will take this to a and, 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 and what happens, uh, I mean, all, for all of you is that the, the, there are so many acquisitions happening that you really need to keep touch with all of these matters, and especially this. For this, every time you take it into the cap, imagine the company that I talked, spoke to you in the morning, and I said, you're meeting that company, they said one acquisition per month. And it's a fact. How? At every time, a capital reserve can be a budget, bulging figure. I mean, I would more appreciate to have the dynamism of the profit and loss account rather than you know create something and 
But anyway, that's the way it is right now. So for NBS, you you got to debate it that way. This is repetition of what we just spoke, so I will not spend time on this. Measurement period adjustments are not included in the profit or loss, obviously. And the measurement period will not exceed one year from the acquisition date. Somebody asked me a question, I think Deepak asked me this question, is what happens if the acquisition, uh, if the measurement period falls between two uh, periods? And I thought so that this which added accountant's question because these questions never come from the corporate sector. They least bother of what happens. But from a disclosure perspective, his life becomes miserable, okay? Um, his life becomes miserable because he has to audit that the disclosure, not prepare that disclosure which everybody understands but does not follow. Okay? I thought there would be a laughter, but anyway. Um, uh, keeping that aside, uh, the acquirer needs to know that the measurement period, therefore it's very important as a measurement period and the uh, changes. Because anything that happens post the 12 months or the yeah. one year, it all goes into the profit and loss account thereafter. It will not be adjusted onto your uh, the, the absolute figure. Yeah. This is common control. Now what is common control? We spoke in the bottom a little bit of that. This happens when the combining entities or businesses are ultimately controlled by the same party or parties. Both Circle that before and after the transaction, each word is as heavy as gold. In today's time, gold is valuable. Combining entities or businesses, combining entities or businesses, ultimately controlled by the same party or parties before and after the transaction, and circle that control is not transitory. Only then will you talk of business combination in the common control scenario. This is not existing in IFRS. This does not exist in 103 in the sense that IFRS 3R doesn't have common control transactions the way they're written down like this. These things have come from US GAAP and then they are being modified a little later on. But this is very important. We have it and in there. So now remember this. Now, when I talk about this, what comes to your mind? What words come to your mind? Related parties? Because that's what it is all about. Because this is what happens. All transactions between related parties, they will not go in the purchase method. Because it will be saying, making self-profit all the time, I want to decide to do something. So that's not permitted. But again, we need to decipher all these things very well and very clear that all these, uh, you can say, parameters, they have to be compliant. IFRS is, again, to repeat, I said this last time, IFRS is principle-based. US GAAP is rule-based. INDS is a carve-out of IFRS, so INDS is principle-based. So it means as many people here, as many principles created, as many judgments possible, but you can't have absolute vague answers because finally it is, you know, you are there. So I don't, therefore, I don't talk about any answers to any questions when you deal with, is it common control or not? Is it purchase method or not? Is it reverse acquisition or not? Can I look at it like this? Can I look at it like that? The answer is yes to both. And nothing wrong in it. Provided you have an absolute strong strategy of how to present and or your assumption criteria and your you know, deciphering criteria as to why you say something like that. That's my principle. And I wanted to make this very clear is because everything from now till the end that we have or everything that you overall is all going to be judgmental. Because all these things are very simply written. Ultimately controlled, you have to find out whether that control is what it is. You have to find out whether it is before and after. Whether it is before and if it is not after, then what happens? Do you still do common control with a small caveat? So, you know, these, therefore I will any more stress on this 
because this is an exception to the entire India's 103. Normally everything will be purchase method and he said in the morning also that you will use more of purchase method than pooling of interest because here you use pooling of interest method. You just add on. Right. Okay. The extent of non-controlling interest before and after the business combinations are not relevant at all in this case. I want to stress on control is not transitive. What does it mean? I am talking about to sell future, in future. Some exit mechanism for one of the rooms to get out. <coughs> so if it is transitory, then what happens? And then you have to go to the Yeah, you have to because this is and. Okay, you have to remember this is first and and. The moment you may still be under the parties may be still related, etc., etc. But if control is transitory, you still don't fulfill these. So we have to be very careful. There is an and involved in this, and you have to be very careful when you're looking at such things because these type of transactions, though we say they are rare, they become non-rare in India. In India, they are yes. And in India, there should be functional control or ownership control. No, no. And and what I call is in banks and institutions. These type of transactions can be there. You know, today morning before we were in that uh, asset paper. So it's transistor, you know, for the bank. It will get transferred, right? Okay, I can I can leverage uh, one more. I, I'll, I'll take that. I'll tell you what. If you do a lot of deals and understand the acquisition scenario, normally a merger sub is created, and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Merger sub. When you create a merger sub, it's a subsidiary, it's only for the purpose of the merger. Once the merger is done, it toggles. Okay? It folds into. Like you have the so that's a transitory one. This is not the scenario normally done earlier in India. We never we never create merger subs, but it is now going to be seen. You just create a sub in between for the purposes of acquisition. Once the acquisition is done, it folds into. It was decided only for the purpose. Now this requires to be done in North American and other entities earlier because there are tax issues involved, there are licensing issues involved, whether you can do business in that state or not, whether uh, all my assets need to be transferred or not, and any number of reasons. So you create one just for the sake of doing this whole exercise and then fold into it. So that is transitory. You get my point. Now versus functional and operational, it has to be a total control. You cannot have either or. Because the operational control you can easily see, but it has to be that also. Then only you can see, because when we deal with, coming to deal with how... Operational, ownership control or operational? Either control or ownership control. No, what, see, I, I mean, we saw in the morning when he said 50 plus 1 was a normal scenario earlier, but now it is not going to be seen as ownership alone. Alright? So this control also will have to be assessed on the same basis, then? That's the last one. Accounting for common control, look at the simple scenario. This is what can happen. Pre-transaction, post-transaction. The shareholders remain the same. The entity remains the same. There are two subsidiaries. Now one is folded into the other. So what happens here is the control is uh, not transitory. It remains the way it was, pre and post. That's what you will decide. Go back to the slide and understand. Combine the entities or businesses, they are ultimately controlled by the same party. So in this case, it is ABC and the shareholders don't change. This is only the assumption that nothing changes. If there is a slight change somewhere, you had it. I mean, that's why you have to look at it. It's not so simple. Entity ABC can be fine. But shareholders, if they change? That's a very important scenario. The shareholders can be individuals, can be mutual funds, can be private equity players, can be who not and what not in this entire scenario. Um, and then control is not transitory. In this example, on the slide, you can't find out whether control is transitory or not. I'm assuming that it is not, okay? Because there could be a reason that a subsidiary 2 was created only for that purpose or something like that. So each one with a pinch of salt. Okay, this is a little more detailed analysis of the same thing just to help you better. The acquisition in this case will be accounted for using the pooling of interest method. The assets and liabilities of subsidiary 2 will not, so now you imagine on your, in your mindset, okay, the assets and liabilities of subsidiary 2, which was the bottom one, will 
Therefore, we reflected that their carrying amounts in the consolidated FS of subsidiary 1. We're talking of consolidation because it's come under one fold. And we're talking of carrying amounts. Why? Holding of interest method. Why? Common control. No adjustments will be made to reflect fair values. Obvious reason, pulling of interest method, or recognize any new assets or liabilities. So no identifiable, intangible assets and all that, okay? Adjustments to the extent of harmonizing of accounting policies would need to be made, because companies may have different set of policies in the books, and in, in, in this country, as many companies, as many policies. So if they are in the same group also, they will be doing what they want. So, so when they come under one fold, Harmonization is necessary, otherwise consolidation can be a nightmare. Okay? The balance of retained earnings which appear in subsidiary 2, the bottom one, is of course aggregated with that of subsidiary 1 on consolidation, or you may also transfer it to general reserve. Now that's an or nothing to do with this, whatever choice. The most important is the next one. The excess, if any, between what? Between the amount which is therefore reported as share capital when you do this consolidation plus any additional consideration which has been received in the form of cash or other assets and the difference between this amount and the amount of share capital of subsidiary 2 will therefore be transferred to the capital reserve. That's how it goes and fits in there when you look at the bargain purchase option that it goes and fits into the capital reserve. That's where you talk about and therefore all the others. You see even in, even in these cases um, the preference for um, uh, you know common control is uh, I think it is Appendix C, Para 9 of the standard, which talks in detail analysis of how you do this. These pointers come from there. Para 9, Appendix C of uh, uh, standard, and, and Appendix C is an, uh, an entire appendix of about ten pages or five pages, whatever is contributed only to common control transactions. That's right. Pooling of interest, AS14, there is no difference as such. But the way in which the, these, these concepts were not existing, transitory, yes. huh? all that you need yes. to be careful. But the only, yeah, the only difference is that uh, this share capital difference, which as per AS14 can be taken to general reserve, now we are specifically yes. saying that it should be taken to capital reserve because, and it is right, because what you are doing is that you are reducing capital. So you have to, uh, like what you create capital reduction of the capital reserve, it is something like that. And that is why it is saying that you have to be moving. Uh, yeah, and this point of capital is on by what speech, so what they say you take it under the there is a practical uh, scenario where two uh, different companies be merging their uh, two different business and one of which A is a company who is demerging uh, a particular segment to a third company C, B is a different company, uh, they are demerging uh, their one segment to C. Now A is controlling on C, so how means as it will not see, you have to have common control before and after put together. If there is a new entity outside whose acquisition was coming inside, will not be affected by, by this methodology at all. You have to be, therefore, therefore the rarity of this. You see, many, there are many ingenuine transactions happening, and Jayesh Bhai will agree to that, as to how to structure it whether with, without common control or with common control. Because the matters are all different. The moment you say common control, goodwill nahi aega. Intangible assets nahi aega. And now you want, you are craving to have all of that, right? So the idea is not to get into common control, but to find a way out. But if you cannot, then you need to follow this. Now the problem is the A, A ka jo demerger ho raha hai, that is a, again a common control. Because I am demerging into a, a company where I am controlling. Okay? But the, for the B, jo demerge ho raha hai, it is not a common control. So for us, uh, CFS, Will I take the uh, demerger of uh, segment of... It all B? depends what is B and C, are they subsidiaries? B is the separate, separate company. entity by itself. And by that is being acquired by C. It, it has been demerged into a, a company called C. Okay. And also a particular segment of a, a 
be merged into C. So finally, what will remain? What is the entity that remains? Can I just all all the three companies remain? Okay. So 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 what happens in your case is that as as far as A is concerned, okay, it will be a common kernel transaction. As far as another entity is concerned, it will not be common kernel; it will be a conscious transaction. So when you will take assets of that another company, it will be of the nature of fact. Uh, See, that is, that, that is you know coming from the so there are standard, there are two different transactions. So if you combine, you can, but again it all depends why I asked the question, what is the remaining entity? If all are remaining, then what you said is you can do one this, one transaction, this, one transaction, that, and get it. One transaction fair value and other thing. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. There are two transactions which are Look at this example. We just continue this with numbers to to fit into the place. Um, so you have the purchase consideration, which is eight hundred thousand, which you need to know is the is the value that we have to see when you uh, decipher it with the share capital. The cash, because you need to talk about cons uh, subsidiary two assets because they all sit into subsidiary one with consolidation. So carrying amount of the assets, carrying amount of the liabilities, the share capital, so and so reserve pre the acquisition date, so and so reserve post the acquisition reserves, uh, and therefore the assets and liabilities and subsidiary two will obviously reflect in number one. No adjustments will be made, and therefore the adjustment is therefore by eight hundred, which you minus against the share capital, and the hundred thousand, which is the excess, which you talked about, the excess if any between the share capital issued plus any consideration received. Against the share capital of subsidiary two will be adjusted against the capital reserve. And when I was talking of capital reserve, mind you, their disclosure has to be done because capital reserve we have so many other items. You have to separately disclose capital reserve from this particular transaction, and then disclose that this capital reserve amounting to so much is from this transaction, so that your capital reserve also has, uh, you know, been now deciphered and and, and, and broken. Let me now introduce reverse acquisition, which is one of the last topics for the in the S matter in within, because thereafter we need to do some exercise. Okay, so to make you hungry and eat well thereafter, but don't go to sleep with power property plans and equipment. All right, so uh, and because that's always a big spreadsheet that you want to see, and you want to have your eyes gazed onto the Excel spreadsheet, so you need to be more uh, uh, attentive. Now, reverse acquisition. This occurs when entity, uh, I told you here you have patience to read, so I will read with you and please read this together with me because here you have to read, okay? There's no choice. This occurs when an entity that issues securities slowly and steadily, I'm saying, is identified as an acquiree for accounting purposes. I have changed the definition of what I spoke up till now to the acquirer to the acquiree. So you now have two concepts. Accounting acquirer, accounting acquiree, legal parent, legal subsidiary, legal acquirer, legal acquiree into this mm -hmm. picture. And therefore these terms will be used every now, every line will use them and this is where you need to really appreciate. Because what's happening is the side is changing. This person with the yellow uh, shirt comes in my place and I go and sit there is what happens. Because the acquirer is the one who is issuing the securities is normally the acquirer. But he in this case will be identified as the acquiree for accounting purposes, not legal. If I issue the shares, I still am the legal parent or the legal acquirer. But for the accounting purposes, I'll be called the accounting acquiree. Look there now. This example has been absolutely picked again from the standard so that when you read the standard you can really appreciate what it is. And this is one of the very simple and fine stand, uh, examples to understand reverse acquisitions. So reverse acquisition may sometimes occur when a private operating company wants to become a public <coughs> entity. This is an example. Huh? But it does not want to register its equity shares. So it doesn't want to take the pain of doing that. So to accomplish that, what the private entity will do is, it will arrange for a public entity to acquire 
its equity interest in exchange for what? In exchange for the equity interest of the public entity. So the public entity will give its shares and in lieu of the shares of the private entity. But what was the goal of doing this? The private entity wants to become a own uh, you know, listed entity in the shares, therefore the exchange will happen. And in that process, the public entity is a legal acquirer because it is issuing the equity interest and the private entity is a legal acquirer because its equity interests are getting acquired. Now these are aspects which are there on the legal front. In the accounting front, public entity will be the acquirer because who will finally remain? Which entity will remain? Private entity is the acquirer and the public entity is acquiring. Nothing happens, your accounting changes. Because of this, the accounting changes. And the question is, which company or entity will remain? That is the one that decides. So the acquiring, again, again going to the first slide, acquiring must meet definition of business for recording transactions. If it is not business, then again this whole thing becomes absolutely normal. Then you're not going into because in order to come into India's 103, first you should have a then again, so basically that macro thing remains common everywhere, please understand. Therefore, reading from the first page in chronological order makes sense, okay? Not that answer you read first the way I told you. Acquiring generally issues equity shares to the owners of the acquirer. This is what will happen in a reverse acquisition. We will see it through the example of how it works in the same way. The same private entity and public entity. Now, to accomplish that, we just repeated that. So what is the analysis? The public entity is the legal acquirer because it has issued its own shares in simple language. And the private one is a is legal acquirer because its asset, uh, equity was acquired for a consideration. However, this is very important and this is the crux of the matter. Because control of the public entity now falls into the hand of the former shareholders of the private entity. Because that was the main purpose of doing it, right? It wanted to acquire the shares of the public entity in lieu of its own shares so that control could transfer. And therefore the listed entity is now just the acquiree for accounting purposes, called the accounting acquiree. And then the private entity becomes the acquiring, uh, the accounting acquirer. This process is reverse acquisition. And in this reverse acquisition, how the accounting will be done is a little different from other factors. You need to build into, you know, the whole, um, your whole macro ideas of goodwill, of uh, purchase method, of all that will remain the same. But how will you embed it? How will you do the uh, add across and add-ons and, and subtractions? <coughs> which of the public entity or the private entity will follow its carrying value, which will pick up the index 103 value, is what is to be seen. <coughs> so the accounting for reverse acquisition. This is what is interesting for you, because if you come to a situation where a reverse acquisition is to be done, this is what you need to do, right? First, the assets and liabilities of the legal subsidiary which is the accounting acquirer. Now who remembers who was the accounting acquirer in this in this example? Please decide. Let me go back and show you. Who is the acquirer? So very careful. The, the, the accounting acquirer, you will recognize and measure the pre-combination carrying amounts because its values are going up and getting consolidated. The assets and liabilities of the legal parent, who is now the accounting acquiry, the public entity, if you remember, that will be recognized in accordance with India's. Why? Because it's a legal acquirer, it's giving the shares, it's issuing the equity interest, it is acquiring. Therefore, acquisition from that perspective, India's 103 applies, all the rules apply there when you're doing the assets and liabilities. The retained earnings and other equity balances of the legal subsidiary which is nothing but the accounting acquirer, which is a private company in your case, before the combination, whatever existed. And then, the amount which will be recognized in the exchange of shares between the two. So what happens? What this paragraph means is, in you know, removing all the jargons and all of that put together, is 
what is it that the public entity will exchange the shares for with its legal parent that that uh, ratio will be used to calculate the fair value of the transfer of the acquiree interest in the public entity. So it's A, you take A and B, and if A is the public entity and B is the private entity, then A's ratio that has been determined as a swap ratio will determine the methodology of exchange of shares for this uh, uh, B into A to get the value. That is what you normally do. Otherwise, in this case, there is no other work happening. You are actually exchanging interests. You are exchanging shares. That's what is happening. But you have to value them, right? So how do you value them? That's way. Now, if I read the jargon, it sounds like this. What I explained to you was simple, if I meant to be simple. However, the equity structure reflects the equity structure of the legal parent. What happens in a consolidation? When you remove all your entries, what is the share capital that remains? Of the parent, right? Okay. So, including the equity interest of the legal parent issue to affect the combination. Accordingly, the equity structure of the legal subsidiary is restated using the exchange ratio which I talked about and that is established in the acquisition agreement to reflect the numbers of shares that will be issued in the reverse acquisition. So in this case, the share purchase agreement will have to lock the exchange ratio, which again will have to be worked out and wondered because it's a part of the negotiation deal. <coughs> with this, I end my session with just one planning consideration for all of you in a general scenario is that if you really need to do accounting for business combination, these are the steps. Nothing is found in your pages. Why are you turning them? It's not there. It will be given now because I, so that's the way it should be. Okay. Gather company and transaction data. And don't assume that gathering a, a, a company and transaction data is your assistant's job. Please. You need to create the checklist if you need to do with experience. Because if you ask for and get what, okay? So it's garbage in, garbage out. If you didn't ask for information, you're not going to get any. So you should know what you need to ask. So that's what it is. These are just simple things, but I'm telling you what to need. You need to find out. Again, that goes to, to, your, to what I told you, nature of business. If you do not understand appropriately, then get knowledge of the nature of the business before you ask questions, because you may miss out on the biggest aspect uh, of asking for gathering of information and data. Analyze the information obtained and of course assess the need to involve outside experts if you cannot take care of whatever. Understand the deal terms and the accounting impact. Measure and recognize the consideration which has been transferred. When I say measure and recognize, I'm not asking you to do the company's job. If you are the auditor, you also need to measure and recognize so as to be ready to question the corporate entity whether you are right or not. If you just take that valuation done, if you just take what Jayesh Bhai said, take somebody's work and put it into your audit file and say my audit is done, I have nothing to say. Recognize identifiable assets acquired, liabilities assumed, and the non-controlling interest. Right from day, day slide 1 to slide end, we said the same thing. Measure contingent consideration, if any. Measure the identifiable assets because they need to come on, and then recognize and measure the goodwill. When I say, I mean, when I use these words, measure, recognize, uh, then again measure, all these are both angles. I always think that it is equal duty of an auditor, and that's what we follow, and I'm sure will, uh, you will know, tell me. We have the financial statements of the company ready on our, on our files when we're talking to the CFO. After having taken the data from them, to, to question them whether they have done it correctly or not. We don't wait for somebody else to come back and say whether they ought to prove what it is. We cross, uh, cross question. We say we believe that your data should be this. Now answer. Not the other way around. But you have to be ready with your own sets of questions. And that's why I said you need to have this ready. Otherwise, it will be a simple thing. The company will come and give you a valuation expert A, B, C. Then you are just going to collate and put it and walk away. Then you also have to have the um, wherewithal to, un, uh, to answer anybody when they question you as to what sort of work it has been done. Because if you just collated material from people and kept it on your record, what was the work done? 
That's important. Now, nothing more after this, but you got some pages with you. Now you have to refer to the pages, which were shared during the uh, break. Just a minute. And this is, read the, read the question with the diagram on it. Um, it's, uh, it's question one for the day. And I need you, it's very, it's very light uh, reading material. Spend about five to seven minutes reading it, and another five to seven minutes analyzing it, and, and then coming up with an answer. I will not give the answer. There is no answer for this. I will not give the answer. So I will take answers from you, and that's why I've stopped well in time, because that's what I believe a workshop should be, a, 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 set, you know, a conference should be. You need to do it, because I know after you go back from here, nobody is going to do whatever. OK. We'll, we'll answer it. Let's just spend time on this, because we have to crunch. I have to also take care of the time that has been offered to me, so that way. time is over, the analysis time has begun. So I hope you're analyzing.
may we start with the discussions because I want to see how many answers are there. How many different types of answers are there and therefore few people will have to bell the cat. Either you swarm auto bell the cat or you let me pinpoint. I would like to ask those people last time who raised up their hands that they have worked on and that's an easier bet for me, you know, that they worked with NDS. I really remember this man here. And I also remember the one there, I mean, right? Yeah. At least two I remember I said that they worked on NDS. Who of you, both of you wants to pick, pick, up, pick up to talk on this? If you if you want to, and just I uh, and there's no way hard fast for hard and fast for okay? I just thought that's the way I would think about it. Lovely. Uh, question is how, do, how does one account for this transaction? Okay. So first we'll go. Uh, uh, we'll go from start point. That first I'll see whether it is a business combination or not. Wonderful. So my first uh, first test is to analyze whether it is business combination and India's one zero three applies or not. So yes, we is acquiring total business of A through ownership as well as it, uh, we have treated it as a merger. So this is a business combination. Hats off to him, he is following what exactly was told today in the morning. So he's a good student. Yeah. Uh, then the second step is to analyze the purchase consideration. Uh, by analyzing, uh, it is stated that uh, net asset of the A is less than the purchase consideration paid. That means there is uh, uh, intangible assets which should be identified. So we will first identify the intangible assets in that and then we will compute the goodwill after the next step. Up to the numbers, now up to your first stage you were very good. Mm -hmm. Thereafter you were okay, so we will wait. Now here there is some yes. now here there is something that purchase consideration which is paid is partly paid by the uh, parent holding company, uh, ABC, mm -hmm. and part consideration is paid by B. That is what they can do. It has to be, uh, you will see life considerations of this kind only, right? You cannot see yeah. uh, what you saw on the board earlier. <laughs> that was only for me. This is for me. So, any any thoughts? I still, I still want, uh, this is, you started well. The thing is, what is this? What is this transaction? How will one account for the transaction? I'm not interested in the numbers because there are no numbers. It's just I'm interested in the understanding of the concept of with the data provided. How do you account for this transaction? Yes, it is in S103. Yes, it is a business. You've got your five marks. Who is A, B, C? Who is B? Who is A? Yeah. Ask the Identify the acquirer. Identify the acquirer. Tell me who it is. He still wants to do it. Very good. Acquirer is B. We will get an acquiring D is A. That has to be obvious, right? Yes. B. Right. So I don't know. I, I, don't, I will not answer. I mean, we'll let you talk because your answer can be right. Somebody else's answer can also be right. This is a very open ended question and an open ended case which can have a couple of answers and all of them can be right. So that's what I'm saying. That's why I like to produce something like this to talk. And the next example is a very easy one. So that you know, before you eat, you feel, oh, I know my work. And that's why the answer is also provided for the next one, but not for this one. So the second one is very, very simple. But the first one is really rack your brains. Please do it again. So what is it? He said B is the acquirer. How many people believe it? Just two people, three people. And the rest do not believe it, OK? Why is B not the acquirer? Now all the balance who did not put up their hands will have to answer. Because it ultimately gets merged with A through the fourth scale. Shares is the test that that because ABC ultimately is the holding company, it still funds itself by equity, giving it to B, then my acquirer changes. So what am I trying to say? What am I trying to say in this example? Uh, so, are you, so what are you coming to? 
It's a transaction between the related parties. Okay, so that's one way of yeah. thinking it. Yes. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. No. Uh, but it's not uh, getting triggered by the common control uh, accounting. Why? Right? Uh, just because the, the transfer of control is the transitory one. Mm. And the common control has to be before and after. Good. All these are good answers. But coming from different people, so you have to have all the answers together. Huh? <laughs> so please understand. No, it, it's, it's one against all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he has given, actually, he has given stats. I think you should go step by step. Yes, so yes. The first so if you directly go to the whole step. See, acquisition of all the shares of A by B. Let's see how to, how to read this. But anyway, acquisition of all shares of A by B. Okay? Purchase consideration is greater than the fair value of the net assets accounted in the books of A, that's fine. So you know that you will be arriving at a good bill, right? Module of B with A through a court approved scheme. Judge why I picked this up only because we spoke last time. <laughs> so the court approved scheme is a, is, a, is a jiggle box here. But anyway, we will not get into those things because that's too much of the legal asset. You, you concentrate on the module of B with A. So through a court approved scheme. So what happens? Which is the entity that will remain? A remains. And B was formed only as a wholly owned subsidiary of ABC for the purpose of this incorporate, whatever. So to a certain extent, when you say that control is transitory, see, the, all the facts are not there, right? But we have to think about all these factors. That's why this is a, a question which just puts you to think. The answer can be either this or that. Now this control is transitory or not is a big is a big question. It may be an answer yes, it may be an answer no. First of all, do you believe that ABC Limited with B being its subsidiary and A being the third one involved, this is the common control transaction. How many say it's a common control transaction? Partly. There are two parts to transactions that I will be. The first is uh, the acquiring shares of A, that's one part of it, where accounting will be different. After that, common control is created, and that will be the second part. No, I will not be and do that. Please understand, all of these have to be taken at one. It's substance over form. You can't break it up like this because this is all acquisition together. And at this stage, you you cannot break. You see, yeah, but the first stage, even if we do that way, the first stage will take care of what we are planning, or what we are ultimately getting to. Let's let's say for the argument, what you're trying to come to is: is there common control? Do you think there is common control? Part. In the second part, see, I, I I would break up this into two. Uh, first is when we acquire shares of A. That time accounting will be decided on PPA. And second part, then the common control will come in and that would anyway ultimately take care of what we are trying to achieve. Anybody's thought of the funding, how it is going to be done, is going to come from the ultimate parent company and then also by this. See here, I was, what I was trying to let me, we don't have to have time. Let me try what I was trying to drive home the message. Let's let's see, there's no fixed answer. There is another concept that you could have thought of here was reverse acquisitions. Because I, if I am not a proponent of common control, what will I say? Suppose if I color myself with judgment and say, yes, ABC owns B and B owns A, but that B owns A after it acquires. Before it acquires, there was no common control. A was some third party. So I can look at it that way and still continue and I can still have an answer that this is common control because because on the day it has already happened so you know it has happened so there's a very thin line both the answers can be okay you can either go thinking about the reverse acquisition methodology or common control so it's a question I mean this is an example I'm just trying to inculcate the, the, the traction between all of you that this is the way to think about each one of these factors it could be this or that, very thin line is to be drawn and understood. Now what happens if it's a reverse acquisition? Who is the accounting acquirer? 